So thank you all so much again for joining us for Shorts Program 1, Remains to be Seen. I'm very pleased to have a few of the filmmakers here with us on Zoom for the Q&A. Um, we have Vika Kirchenbauer, Kilar Monsal, and Noor Al Amal, who is Muad El Salem's collaborator on the film This Day Won't Last. Um, firstly, I want to just thank you all for your films. I think um, they're all very rich and um, complicated works that um, I think are um, really interesting in conversation with one another. And um, I'm excited to kind of speak to you all about the ways in which um, they touch upon themes, related themes. Um, so I find that the works um, in various ways aim to uncover and somehow render visible histories and experiences that often go unseen or unknown or are somehow lost to us. And I'm interested in the various formal techniques that each of you use to make present and visible what often remains um, unseen. So um, I have some specific questions um, regarding each of the films in relation to this. Um, so maybe Pilar, we could begin with you. And if you could speak a bit just about the background on the bread mutiny and how um, you came to make a work about um, the role of the women who led this revolt. Oh, uh, the beginning of the film was uh, something I have read uh, in this, uh, this book from Silvia Federici, Carvame uh, la Bruja, I don't know the, the, the name in English. Caliban and the Witch. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, um, um, is the, the relation between the, the, origin, the origin of the uh, principle of accumulation in capitalism and the relation between women's bodies, no? So, um, uh, I have read this book and I found there like uh, uh, this, this story about the, the, the bread machinery that was happening in my, in my city, in the city I, I was born. Um, in Cordoba, I come from the south. I, I, I'm not living there anymore, but uh, uh, I come from there, so I have some like strong relationship with this land. So for me, it was really like uh, something that I didn't know. That's something really specific, no? Like uh, the story of some kind of uh, revolt, but. Uh, that it was the first time I have written this book. Uh, like, uh, I think the book is 2007 on, or nine in Spain, the edition, the, the last one. So for me, it was something like really uh, strong in the sense of uh, some really old story that you cannot read in the, this, the history books from your city or your province or your community but then you 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 find it like uh, years later and at the same time the my city Cordoba uh, is really known uh, about uh, a, a, like a really strong uh, feminine imaginary of this kind of uh, like a brown woman with different who is really coming from this painter from uh, Julio Romero de Torres that uh, from the beginning of the 19th century, but then it's supposed that uh, they were like the, 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 the main building of this kind of feminine imaginary of the Spanish feminine, something like that. I don't know in my English, it's not the best, but I think I, I could try the, the way. So uh, it was something related between this kind of, uh, unseen of this story, you know, the revolt, and the super scene <laughs> of this kind of feminine uh, cliché of the city. Mm -hmm. And the main uh, meaning of this uh, feminine image 
it was more or less the opposite of this kind of revolt imaginary. So for me, it was something, the beginning of the field, it was something like a, a research to look for this kind of conflict between the, the unseen and the hyper seen or super seen. I don't know how you call in English, but something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, but uh, across the images, mainly, and the, and the world, the, the voice, no? something like uh, you can like, make this kind of aesthetic uh, uh, conflict, no? dialectic or something like that. No? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm seeing, Vika, in your work as well, a very similar kind of um, you know, the, like the budding up of these two things, the seen and the unseen. So I wondered if you could also touch on the starting point of this work for you. So, um, yeah, I agree. I just want to thank you also for the program because it is often attempted that like works enter a conversation <clears throat> with one another, but it doesn't always work out. And I think in this case, it really did work out really beautifully. And I was happy to watch the whole program and and think further as like all of the films approach that question from like a different angle. Mm -hmm. So in my case I was interested in or I keep thinking about violence and images or violence and disability and there's a maybe somewhat like societal conception that violence is something that if it happens it can be seen from all perspectives. And I think that um, depending on where we stand as individuals or as groups, if, if we cannot see violence, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And it also doesn't mean that we're not implicated and it's becoming. Um, so in my case, um, I made a personal film on <clears throat> memory loss and at the same time an essay film about uh, colors outside the visible spectrum which is a kind of like challenge in moving image that is um, that will fail in a way because you can't show what you can't remember and you can't make people see colors that just by default, even if they are able to see, they can't see. <clears throat> and from that, um, I kind of meditate in the film uh, with different references on how violence works outside the visible spectrum, basically, mm -hmm. and how <clears throat> trauma or traumatic memories and occurrences can be felt but not made visible. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of inviting um, the viewer to consider violence as something that lies beyond what they can perceive. Mm -hmm. Um, and a question I have for both you, Vika, and also for uh, Noor and Moad is um, this, the process of editing in relation to writing the text and whether this, these two things happened kind of simultaneously if you wrote the voiceovers um, in relation to the images or if the text kind of pre-existed and were things that kind of then fit in later to the edit. Um, yeah. Um, Go ahead, Mika. Or, yeah, either way. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because um, you call it the voiceover, but in fact, it's kind of a voiceover, but it wasn't written. It was just... Um, expressed and it, it yeah uh, it was what he had to say what Muad had to say and that's it so there wasn't a script or there wasn't um, something that had to be uh, constructed or, or something um, and in fact, we we edited, or I edited for about two years um, without any text. Um, and I, I 
imagined how this could touch the hearts of people, but um, it didn't have the, the content. As long as the words weren't there, it hadn't the real content or the real uh, message that we wanted to convey. And then very soon, once we had the, uh, the text, it blended together like as if it was meant to be, but it wasn't meant to be because we worked a lot on, on it. But there was no, um, um, it's not that when we had the text, we worked more on the edit. The edit was almost already there and done. Okay, so the edit was in place and then Muad would kind of speak over the images as and kind of respond to the piece? Mm, no, in fact, he responded not really to the piece. Of course, the piece was in his mind because that mm. was what we were work working on. But um, f from the beginning, he had the urgency to express something, but he couldn't put it into words. And since I don't speak Arabic, he was like, yeah, but I can't tell you, you won't understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So it was a very uh, important moment when there was someone who entered the process, David. David, who did also the sound of the movie. Okay. In fact, I contacted him as a translator. And they talked so much. And the fact that Muad could speak to David in his own language made him produce all this uh, text almost all at once. Mm. Thanks. How about for you, Vika? Um, it's quite different and seeing Muad's film also like I, I almost envied the courage to just improvise and, and speak uh, without a script. In my case, it was quite uh, different. I wrote the first couple of versions of the script before I started working with the images. And as I had that, I could imagine what kinds of images I would want to work with or I would pursue uh, in trying to find or create. Not all of that worked out, um, but that's a different story. Um, and then once I had gathered like some images with the text in mind. I edited it just rhythmically without any spoken text yet. Mm. And then um, many, many versions of the voiceover text later, I recorded it and then I was not happy with like two or three things and then I wrote again. And so there was like 28 versions of the text in the end and several recordings. Um, um, because it had to be precise and in many ways because there are different levels that needed to make sense. So there's like the scientific level of like radiation and light and perception and then there's the personal level, then there's like the, the trauma or like the subconscious level. So there are like different levels that needed to make sense. So whenever I changed anything in the text, I had to think what does this new word mean <clears throat> in relation to all the other words. So in a way, it was um, really difficult to write that text and for it to make sense on like different layers at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Pilar, I want to come to you with kind of a similar question about wow. um, the, the text that we hear over the images of the paintings. And I'm also curious about your choice of, of the paintings as well. Yeah, I was thinking about that uh, here in Vika also because for me it was something like uh, uh, working like from the beginning it was the idea more related to the text that you can read in the screen, no? the, the, the historical or the context mm -hmm. text. Uh, and then I had this other like narrative of this like tale or something related to the history but it's really written by me. So. Uh, but uh, and at the beginning, I, it was not clear, like it was something like this, this all these kind of ideas of what, what, uh, what it was I, were, I want to talk. 
that uh, then in the editing I found something like the need, uh, the necessity uh, of uh, taking this tale, this kind of voice, like uh, more like related to literature, or this kind of narrative uh, uh, subjectivity also, because the the image of this painting and also the images of the the woman in the museum uh, were like stronger together with this kind of voice, no? Mm -hmm. Something like that, like that. So uh, the, it was something related to the editing. Uh, the, the first part, so the first part, this context, context text was at the beginning. The other part was something like more an idea. So this like narrative text with the voice uh, came at the uh, editing time. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't get if you, you you were asking me about the, the selection of the paintings. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, this that, that's interesting because this is the, the first museum I have ever been there. So it's like my first museum in my life, and it is a place where I used to go when I was a child with my father, like every Sunday or something like that. And from the very beginning, I don't remember how old I was, but I, I really remember this kind of uh, stronger woman in the paintings, like uh, looking at me and trying to tell me something or something like that, no? So uh, for me, it was some, something like, like your, your first painting, your first like strong relation to art. Uh, mm um to add pieces no like really like real uh, relation uh, with with this kind of representation so for me it was something more like a selection made by the 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 place and and the portraits it's more related to the faces like uh, really to the face because uh, there you can find uh, not a lot there are not so much more paintings, uh, uh, but there are a little bit more paintings that you can find in the film. But I'm not sure. I think this, I have made this selection really related to my mm, original relationship with the museum. Some images that I maybe remember more than others, something like that. I cannot explain really good, but it was some like more intuitive and then relation with my past, uh, with these images. And then uh, I think uh, uh, the thing I was thinking also when, when Noir was talking about the, this long editing that I remember from all the other films that I did, the uh, really long editing to think and then, but with this, this piece, for me it was the opposite because uh, I was, I shoot in 16 millimeter so I think I had something like 95% of uh, rough material in, in the film, no? So, mm. because it's really expensive and you can, uh, you need to think a lot and to, to make a good, a good plan for, for the shooting mm. And, mm. and to have really like a really good control of the technical, of all the technical stuff, no? So at the end, when, when I came back, uh, home to, to edit this, all this, this um, film, for me it was something like this, uh, maybe two days of editing or something like that, because it was more like, like to, to pick up some things that was working there, so, and then that's, that's the meaning, and then maybe change the order and try to write something. No, this was a, a process more like uh, the working process was more at the beginning and in the shooting moment uh, that that's on the end. That is like mm -hmm. the opposite way of the other films I have been working also. Okay, thank you. Uh, Noor, could you speak a bit about um, Muad's process of gathering and shooting this footage. Um, it looks to me like it was collected over maybe a long period of time. And also I think there were some pieces that were borrowed from other sources on the internet. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? 
Uh, yes. Um, so we worked on it for about two years. Um, in fact, uh, in the beginning, he wanted to make a very classical documentary where the activists, um, to pay tribute to the activists and where they, uh, uh, yeah, where you would see portraits of Tunisian activists. Uh, we tried that, but uh, no one was available. No one wanted to come into the into the image. So it was, uh, yeah, it didn't work out. So then we decided that he should tell his story because he's sure that he wants to tell his story. But um, then we decided to make it anonymous. That was a, a hard decision because we want to make something visible. But then again, we hide ourselves. So it's it was frustrating. Um, and he made images very intuitively. He sent them to me. Sometimes I took um, images of his social media mm. and I, I was puzzling with it. Um, and so it was sending back and forth ideas and clips. Um, and yeah, some images are from, um, taken from the internet, be, uh, like the queers were here is uh, an image. I think it comes from Palestine, pa Palestine. I'm, I'm not even sure, but um, I wanted to include this image because the, yeah, the, the problem is a problem of not only of Tunisia, but of a larger part of the world. So I didn't find it the problem to take something from another um, country with this uh, message, because I, I think I, I found that a very strong image, like a bit a shocking images, image and uh, shocking in a positive way. Um, then there is the, the footage of the manifestation is also taken from social media sites, but he was there. So he, he was there, but he didn't shoot so much footage of it. And I wanted to um, make it a larger part of the, like not a single clip that is uh, away before you have seen it. Um, so yeah, and we, we jump in time, in fact, we jump back and forth and it's not chronological, but that was one of his uh, wishes to make something very spontaneously and not to uh, thought about and without a scenario. Great, um, Vika, I wondered if you could speak about the sequences in the film in which I think I remember from um, your Q and A at the Berlinale that you that I think you it was your own performance, and um, and also how that those images were kind of rendered through like visually with this um, color. Um, spectrum this kind of violet light whether that was um a light that was kind of in the space with you or later applied through post-production so um there are two processes kind of on a technical level i work with thermal imaging like infrared which um is which i've worked with before um and it's of course like people cannot perceive infrared radiation. Um, so the camera doesn't produce an image really just like kind of captures temperature points. And then that those temperature points that are radiated from an object, in that case, my body, are translated into like the visible spectrum as a visualization of what we then might decode on like what's hot and what's uh, cold. So those are like one part of like kind of that attempt of like making something visible that we can see. And in the instance that you just mentioned, the blue images <clears throat> that is shot uh, with a normal video camera, 
under ultraviolet light. So I just lit the scene with um, ultraviolet lighting mm -hmm. and that makes visible some things in its reflection. So um, for example, urine, as is kind of like mentioned in the film, but also visible in the image, there are like certain particles in urine that reflect under ultraviolet light that become more visible and kind of shine yellow. And the reason why we see more blue is that it's basically because of the lamps, um, because there's a tiny bit of um, visible light that is transmitted by them as well. Um, so it's not only ultraviolet light that we can see, but there's also just a bit of like violet light that we can see that is transmitted by the lights. So we, the camera, as I used it, shows that as blue and the reflection of the urine um, as like shiny yellow. Yeah. So it's, yeah, like the infrared part like tries to make visible mm -hmm. um, through translation and the ultraviolet part are like the reflection of something as like a, like a trace. Right. Great. Um, back to you, Pilar. I wondered if you could speak a bit about the, the woman, the women in your film who are kind of from the present day. So um, both the female viewers at the, in the museum scene, but also um, your choice to shoot at the, I get this is the wheat, the public granary of La Cordera Square, like the, the physical location and how you chose to include um, images of the women who are part of your film production. Mm -hmm. uh, the first part, uh, we are like, uh, at the beginning we are there, like uh, me and the, uh, the other woman was helping me there because we were just two. <laughs> so um, I decided to edit this part because at the beginning I, I was not, it was not so sure. It was something like, uh, I, I shoot it. Uh, me and this, uh, and Begonia, this, this other woman there in the, um, in the ruins. But I uh, I was not sure about using that. But then I found it that we were also uh, part of this kind of woman of the present, trying to think and look at this other woman in the past. So at, at the end, that became something like a like so, like an ongoing on ongoing on like representation and reflection about the image of the others, something like that. And for me, it was so important uh, trying to to go there, no? With this kind of, with our presence. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I found also something really interesting about this image uh, that I didn't sure it thinking about that, but me like hearing this kind of like uh, walls, like empty walls and empty place. Uh, and then in the editing, uh, that became a text talking about uh, that the walls and the old the walls and this kind of material can also talk us, talk to us uh, about the past. So uh, these kind of images then uh, went for looking for a text. So it's interesting also, you know, like this kind of, uh, for me, it was really nice to, to find this kind of uh, new things after the, the shooting and the editing. And then uh, the, the other woman in the, the woman in the, in the museum were mostly uh, women. one of them, she's also part of the team. It's, uh, she was also helping with sound at least younger than the others, but what was helping there. Then there are some like a woman of my family. It's my mother and it's my, like sister of my mother. What do you call in English? I don't remember. Your aunt. Yeah. yeah. And then there are like uh, two friends of mine. And then there are like two old ladies. These two old ladies who are, um, they are like this 
it's really nice because they came from another project I was working on like two years uh, before and they are like garden garden keepers in Cordoba there is a like old tradition of uh, this patio like flowers in the patios I don't know if you maybe have heard about that but it's really like an old tradition and mainly um, uh, led by women also like taking care of the flowers and small garden in, in private mm -hmm. spaces and this all the, the both this this old woman you can you can find out they can this I, I was with them in their patios for one year like taking photographs of, the, of their works and then we we can became friends so they are part also of this kind of and seeing women of the history of this kind of other spaces mm -hmm. in the city. Right. So, yes, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Um, Noor, um, I don't know if you could speak to this because this is a question that kind of refers to part of the um, Muad's um, Kind of the stories that he tells but you know the fig tree is obviously kind of a very central story in this film and also this uh, story of the dream that kind of opens the film i just wondered if you could talk a bit about the inclusion of those two stories the the true the two stories are true so mm -hmm. he really had this nightmare and he um explain uh, he told me this nightmare and uh i i found this a very aggressive image like you want to help someone and while you are helping you get bitten by a, a, a dog it's like and i think it's really it it fits to his story because he's very soft he's very caring he's everything that is good but for his society is not good. He's like the worst of the worst. So that's why we started with this uh, nightmare. Um, then the fig tree, uh, that is also a real story. So there was a fig tree, but it, it wasn't in Tunisia. It was in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And they um, tried to save it. And a friend of mine who is really into trees and in poetry and, and stuff found that so nice that they would save the tree that she uh, shot the whole um, move, moving of the tree mm -hmm. for a whole day with uh, tree cameras and everything more than 10 years ago. And then the tree really died. And so bye bye poetry, she was like really uh, very sad about this thing that didn't work out very well. So the um, the images went into the closet. And while we were working, Muad and I, I it reminded me of, of, of that tree and his um, moving back and forth between wanting to stay in Tunisia because he really wants to stay there, but also not always seeing a future and wanting to leave but being scared of leaving for me that was similar to that tree also fig trees are like a real tunisian thing to me mm -hmm. and um that's how we came up with with deciding to take this uh, imagery from my friend who gave it very generously to us mm. okay thank you um, and Vika, back to you. I wondered if you could speak a bit about the the home movies that we see in the film, and also um, the story of um, I think you say that she's your aunt, the Solvig, um, and how you know she's kind of referred to in the images of this kind of um, village parade of sorts. Mm -hmm. So, kind of the whole project started because I applied for a small grant to make a film 
that would center around that uh, witch burning ritual in my home village. So that kind of happened every year, um, a few hundred meters away from where I grew up. Mm. And the witch is a really um, kind of present motive in, in that region. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this witch burning um, that we see in the film, but there's also a lot of like kind of witch culture, like carnivalesque kind of like uh, clubs, but they meet all year round. Um, so I wanted to go and shoot that um, witch burning, the annual tradition of burning that straw witch. And I got the money for that, but then I found out that it, um, they don't do it anymore. They stopped doing it like three, four years ago, um, but I still had to do something. Um, then I tried to like find places where that happens um, in Europe still. And I found out that uh, it's still being done in Denmark, also like a bit different. Um, so I went there, this is kind of what the money was used for that I got. And then on the day after I've been reassured um, that um, it's, it's a tradition for like 300 years, of course we're doing it, it's happening. But then on the day they decided um, they can't do it and then the people were really upset that they were no longer allowed to burn um, kind of the effigy of a woman. Um, also, also then we couldn't film it, obviously. And at first I was uh, sad that like going to Denmark to shoot that thing didn't work out. But then at the same time, I thought um, trying to find an image that I'm looking for and trying to find exactly that and that not happening or that not being possible is actually what my whole film is about. Of like trying to make this, or trying to translate, mm -hmm. trying to access, but not being able to manifest such an image. That is actually the center of the film. So it kind of made sense um, to not be able to produce that image. And so then I worked with like home video footage that was shot there by people in that village over like several years, like 2009, 13, and 2014 or something. And I found images of that, that I then used uh, alongside like other home video footages of the solar eclipse um, and all of these things. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, that's all of my questions for everyone. Um, unless anyone has some final thoughts on their own works or other works or the I, program. I to, yeah, I want to say yeah. something about uh, Moada, the film, uh, because uh, they are they, they were talking about the scene and they, they don't show their faces mm -hmm. in the film and not now. And, and for me, it was really amazing to, to feel something like you don't you don't feel watching the film you don't feel that it's missing something mm. this face because you are really like close to the subject who is talking up, uh, across the images and the bodies and i i feel that uh, this really this is amazing I, I really want to thank you for well all the program i think that the program is, is amazing but in this this the question we were talking about uh, and i think it's it's, it's really really good well well, well uh, how do you call this kind of um, super well approach to this kind of unseen because you are not far of the subjects of the subjectivity of the feelings but you can see his face and that's amazing I think. thank you pilar for uh, your nice words and i want to thank you because you made very nice portraits of women and we don't see enough portraits of women so i think we all should keep making the uh, invisible visible and we're 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 doing a good job i think yes. definitely well i think that's a really wonderful note to end on um Thank you all so much for your very powerful films and for sharing your thoughts and processes with the audience today. Um, 
Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.